everyone. I'm Ida. I'm with the San Francisco Examiner. Um, I'm one of the uh, staff reporters there. Um, and the League of Women Voters of uh, San Francisco is the one that put together this. They are a nonpartisan non political nonprofit that defends democracy. They provide education, encouraging people to vote in elections and participate in government. They also engage in advocacy to influence public policy that benefits the community. And today we'll be talking to Paul Henderson, director of the San Francisco Department of Police Accountability, to talk about police accountability. Um, and so we'll just uh, launch right in there. Um, we're hoping you could give us a broad overview of what the purpose of the Department of Police Accountability does and, um, you know, including its mission and, um, you know, yeah, just tell us about what it does. Sure. So let me just jump right in. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, so the Department of Police Accountability, and this is the agency that was previously known here in San Francisco, was the Department of Citizen Complaints. And uh, a few years ago in 2016, uh, they changed the name uh, and they increased some of the jurisdiction. And now the agency uh, investigates complaints that are made against a police officer. Uh, police officers, uh, we make policy recommendations, we conduct audits, and we mediate complaints uh, as well with the police department. And recently, uh, as of last year, uh, there was an expansion. And so we included complaints uh, and parts for the sheriff's office as well. So we're looking now at trying to figure out if we have to change the name, but that's a charter amendment to <laughs> talk about law enforcement. Uh, but uh, the agency's mission is to, it's a commitment, the Department of Plus uh, Department of Police Accountability is committed to providing the city of San Francisco with independent and impartial law enforcement oversight through investigations, police recommendations, policy recommendations, and performance of audits to ensure that policing reflects the values and concerns of the community served. Uh, and I just want to uh, emphasize the independence part because I think it's really important. And when you're talking contextually about civilian oversight, uh, the independent investigation, I think, is one of the key components that defines uh, a really healthy and robust uh, organization to evaluate uh, law enforcement agencies. And how do you guys measure um, successes in investigating um, cases or failures in doing so? It, it's We look at really trying to measure uh, how we interact and accept and investigate the cases that come in. I think some of the problems in the past and some of the problems that other agencies have, and it's not unique, uh, is that they can't handle the volume or they can't get to the complaints or there's not follow-up or the follow-up isn't timely. And so one of the things that we really try to do is be as transparent as we can with all of the information about the cases that are coming into the agency and how we share uh, that information not just back to complainants when they come in, but with the board, the board of supervisors, with the mayor's office, and with the police commission regularly about what our work looks like, uh, what those volumes look like. And, and I will say that that volume has increased exponentially uh, over the past recent year. So I came to this agency in 2017 uh, and the cases and the volume of cases have gone up over 53% uh, just since uh, the summer of 2017. Uh, and just to give you more context on what a slice of work looks like uh, at the Department of Accountability. So for last year, uh, there were uh, 2,387 allegations that were made uh, and complaints filed and lodged with the organization. And of that, that resulted in 773 independent investigations. Um, and that, that's a big uptick, just to give you context from the previous year in 2018, uh, there were 1,524 uh, allegations made of complaints and 659 investigations. And so uh, all, all of this information, no one has to write any of this stuff down. We try and uh, make it public and put it on our website and it's released regularly in our annual reports but we also report quarterly, uh, monthly, and then during police commission, weekly, uh, week to week as to what some of these numbers are. And I'm just giving you the 5,000 level overview of them, but this is how you quantify the work and how you measure uh, how responsive an agency is to 
the, the communities that it's trying to serve. And what are some of the agency's strengths or weaknesses in the current mission and how you guys measure um, these allegations and uh, what you guys are able to do with them? And if you could contextualize that with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement that's surged, you've mentioned that people are seeking a lot of more information from um, you know, San Francisco comparing it to other, other yeah. jurisdictions. Yeah, I think some of the, the strengths, and I alluded to this earlier about the independent investigation, I think that's really important uh, that agencies that do oversight, civilian oversight, are able to do that. And, and again, just so it all makes sense, there are over 18,000 law enforcement agencies uh, in this country, uh, and yet there are just over 200 civilian oversight agencies, which are uh, defined as best practices. And, you know, I'm not you don't have to take my word for it. The previous administration at the federal level under the Obama administration came out with the 21st century guidelines where they articulated what policing reform and what justice reform should look like and indicated that civilian oversight is one of the things that's important and necessary. Part of what makes that civilian uh, oversight so effective is having a lot of the esoteric language and nuances of policing understood by working professionals to understand and advance many of the reforms. Uh, and if you don't have those agencies conducting independent investigations, those agencies are uh, stuck with having to just review the oversight that the law enforcement agencies are reviewing themselves. And so you are, you are relying on the same reports that the agencies are giving you to make a determination as to whether or not there's been misconduct or a transgression. Um, and so that, I think that's a really important and a key part that uh, makes a difference here in San Francisco. And with, and you know, we're not unique and we're not the only ones that do independent investigations, but it's one of the key factors I think we need to look for when we talk about why is civilian oversight important and how relevant can it be? I, in my opinion, I think it's really important that those agencies are able to develop and implement policy as well. I mean, part of the issue is, in addition to identifying problems and addressing problems that come up from communities, you have to be able to collect data, you have to make data transparent, and you have to analyze data. And then if you want uh, an answer or a response to what those reforms look like, you really have to have two things. You have to have a policy approach to address the institutionalized problems, and you have to have an implementation for a training program to make sure that that department and those officers are trained in a new way reflective of the new policy. In a nutshell, that's why those things are so important. And it's also part of why policy is so important to the work of civilian oversight. And I think those are some of the things that San Francisco uh, does well. Um, and and I, I think we have another, uh, a couple of other tools that I think make us stand out in terms of getting work done and identifying problems in an effective way, uh, which is our audit uh, authority. And so the audit authority is somewhat new and conducting audits allows us to look at and review information in new ways and look to see what the history has been and what effective outcomes can be moving forward based on recommendations that we make by auditing and reviewing material uh, that's coming out of the departments that we're assigned to have oversight. Now that's only as effective as the data that you're collecting and the data that you're analyzing and the data that's being made transparent. And so that's always a key factor. It's not just the oversight agencies acting independently. Part of this work is contingent on being able to collect that information, being able to analyze that information, and being able to share that kind of information and be able to take a deep dive for broad audiences, the folks that make the complaints, and the communities that uh, agencies like Civilian Oversight are designed to serve. Sorry, so what, I know I got uh, on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what can an everyday person or um, people who are particularly passionate about watching the police and what they do and how they're held accountable, um, how can they use the Department of Police Accountability and how do they typically, how can they go about doing that, you know, engaging in the agency? I, I think there's a number of different ways. I think the more informed audiences are, the more precise, the more accurate, and the more effective they can be. And so part of like 
uh, uh, the eight can't wait, for example, uh, movement that's going on uh, in this country is a great flag for folks to learn and identify some of the questions that they might not have been asking before about reforms or about uh, police accountability or law enforcement accountability. Uh, and I'll just give you, just to have a specific example, just like uh, the use of force. Uh, and the majority of law enforcement agencies in this country have not updated their use of force policies. What that means is by adoptive admission, they are still engaging in practices like shooting at cars, like having neck restraint techniques, like having no knock warrants. And these are all things that I, I raise as example because they have been shown to be risky, not just for law enforcement, but for the public as well, and specifically, with communities of color, uh, specifically with immigration communities. And so, it, how, how do why. people, yeah, so oh, how yeah. do people like file a complaint and participate as a witness and, you know, um, be part of the process if they feel like they have a case that they want to have you guys know? There's several different ways. So, you can contact the office by calling uh, right now during COVID. Uh, we have restricted access into the office, but we've doubled the helm to try and make sure that people have broader access through the internet, they can write letters, uh, they can call. Um, just contacting our office is the way to initiate uh, those types of complaints. One of the things that we worked into the policies here in San Francisco is that you can make a complaint in the department themselves. So in any police station, our material as of this year is finally in every single station so that you can make a complaint right there at every station if you happen to be at that station independently of being at our offices, uh, but to contact us. The, those are all the different ways that you can contact us. And, and one of the things that we've expanded is our ability to receive and accept those types of complaints so someone can actually make a complaint on their phone. Uh, and someone can actually contact us that speaks a different language and we have a language access line to make sure that people aren't restricted from being able to communicate with us or to contact us to initiate our investigations uh, for something either that they were a member of or even something that they saw that they want to report. And I, I just want to add, because I think this is an important nuance, that these complaints can come uh, into the agency anonymously as well. And that's not an infrequent thing. Uh, some of the, the stuff that we report on in our annual reports, which is why I, I encourage people to look at that, uh, outlines uh, throughout the year where those complaints come in from, what kind of complaints they are, the neighborhoods that they're coming in from. There's uh, even a race analysis from folks that are making complaints as well as the outcomes from what happens to those complaints as well. And so uh, we, we encourage people to contact us and let us know and I remind audiences all the time that we can't fix what we don't talk about. And we have to create a safe place for people to be able to articulate what their concerns are and what things are happening on the street in real time so that we can follow up uh, and act on their behalf to make sure that we are improving and making our justice system and our law enforcement departments better by having this kind of direct accountability from communities through agencies like uh, Civilian Oversight and DPA. And what are, what's the recourse if someone doesn't like the outcome of uh, what's been found through the process? Well, I mean, you, you know, that's, uh, it, that's a subjective interpretation of people that feel like, and, and it's the same thing with all of our systems. And, and let me just say, just to give it context, in answering that question, DPA isn't the only avenue of recourse against a transgression or bad behavior, right? So we still have the district attorney's office for criminal prosecutions. We still have the city attorney's office, which handles a lot of the civil lawsuits. There's also the internal affairs from the police department and there's DPA. So it would not be unusual if there is a transgression for there to be up to four different investigations going on concurrently. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat subjective for me to presume or know what outcome people want from something that they've either participated in or witnessed. But each of those agencies has a separate approach in terms of managing those expectations and defining what it looks like in terms of what that accountability or what the recourse is. I would say the more transparent uh, that process is, the better. And so 
that's why I, I try and make all of this stuff available online so people can see what happens to their complaints, that it's tracked and measured from the very beginning as to what type of complaint it is, how it goes through the system. There are real restrictions for agencies like civilian oversight in California. Uh, we have some really strong uh, restrictive language in the police officer's bill of rights. And so it's difficult for us to publicize specific information about specific complaints, but we can aggregate that information uh, in our statistics, which is what we release. And we can highlight some of the outlines of those specific cases uh, in our annual reports. Uh, but we can't give specific information about specific officers. Uh, and, and I'm glad you asked that question because it gives me a chance to explain. This is something that comes up all the time. These are essentially like personnel records. So folks whose job it is to be uh, in law enforcement or work with the police department, it, it's like making a complaint against someone that you work with. And then, you know, oftentimes people want to know, well, what happened? And that answer is sometimes restricted in terms of what can be told to the public or the names that can be released, which doesn't mean that there wasn't accountability. It doesn't mean that there wasn't a fine fee penalty, a legal settlement up to and including a termination or possibly criminal charges. But short of it being the criminal charges, a lot of times that information is restricted directly uh, or it's restricted uh, in depth contextually to the specific cases. So I know it's a long way of answering the question, but I think it's- No, no, that actually, that actually led perfectly into the next kind of topic oh, of okay. transparency. So I guess what other kind of reporting does the agency do and where can everyday people find it and you know keep an eye on the, the work that's being done? Oh, so for DPA, a lot of that stuff is in our annual reports. We're about to publish another one right now for 2019. Uh, it got pushed back a little bit with COVID. It was very difficult to coordinate all of the publishing while everyone was working from home suddenly, uh, which came about in March. But uh, that, that document has so much information about what this agency does and how we work and how we operate. Uh, and we post them uh, and publish them on our website. You can find them easily and directly. I will also say though, uh, beyond just the annual report, we give quarterly reports uh, at the police commission and we give weekly reports at the police commission as well, where I talk about what's been happening week to week uh, in between the meetings. I summarize the kinds of cases that we've been having. So that information is all on SFGov TV and you can look at some of the old uh, hearings to see them, or you can watch them in real time on SFGov TV as well as they're happening. So there's information at, at all of those places, in, independent of the information going back and forth with the individuals who are filing their own individual complaints with the office and have ongoing and open investigations. Um, is there any place that collects those weekly updates from the police commission, like through the DPA that uh, people can access? Also on our website. All of this information is at our website, but I'm saying if you, you know, no one wants to go, if you don't feel like reading the summaries or seeing the summations on the website and the quarterly reports, the Sparks report, which has all of our policy recommendations and all of the policy work, if you want to hear it, you can watch it on uh, SFGov TV or you can attend uh, the police commission, although it's all remote now, so they're all hearings and meetings like this. I'm just telling you some of the other places where people can go to find information that's convenient to them to understand more or to see the big picture of the work that we're doing. And, and again, this is just the role that DPA is doing. Oftentimes you can find ancillary information from the police commissioners themselves on their own website and from the police department on their website. And some of the things that I, I think are really interesting about what they're publishing in terms of their data are things like their, their 96A reports, uh, which is the state mandated reporting on race and stops and use of force. Uh, the information uh, that they have as it relates to uh, their early intervention uh, systems about identifying uh, bad actors and trying to do uh, better policing addressing reforms. Uh, the reports uh, dealing with the Department of Justice reforms addressing how quickly the department and what priorities the department has and addressing the mandates from 
the Department of Justice that came to San Francisco a few years ago. All, all, there, these are all the different things to be looking for in all the different places to be finding information. And, and a lot of that information from the department is on the department's website. So you're, you're not just limited to going to DPA's website to get all of this information, but I want to share as many avenues or resources as possible for folks that want to take a deeper dive, learn a little bit more, and educate themselves as to what is actually going on and what direction these reforms are moving in and how DPA fits in context into these little silos that people are reviewing and looking at. So uh, how is the DPA itself held accountable? Like in essence, who watches the Watchmen and um, how can people voice their concerns about the DPA? Like who do they go to? Oh girl, we, we get that every week at, at the police commission. People will call in with opinions about everything that we do all the time. So as I make these reports, people are calling in, uh, sharing their opinion with uh, the agency directly uh, about what's being reported and the news that is coming out of uh, the, not just the Department of Peace, Police Accountability, but also the police department and the uh, police commission itself, because it, it, it's all somewhat related and we do some of the oversight, but like I said, we're not the only agency that is doing oversight. There's uh, internal affairs plays a role that's different and distinct. The city attorney's office plays a role that's different and distinct in terms of lawsuits and civil suits that evolve out of behaviors with the department. And then ultimately the district attorney's office, which evaluates when those transgressions fall below a criminal standard and there's accountability in that area, it, it's the same thing. So it just depends on what people are looking for and where they wanna go. But I, it, it's really important to me to try and make uh, my data as transparent as possible. I will say that that process has been exacerbated recently in California with the passage of the 1421 bill, which makes all of, not all of, but a lot of the transgressions as defined by the statute more transparent and publishable. And so that's a big thing that's not unique to San Francisco, but I think what is unique is how aggressively DPA in particular is releasing documents and trying to make sure that that information is available and those of you that have been watching the news and the stories in the news, it, all, all of, a lot of those stories involve records that we are releasing to make sure that the public knows about our work that's being done and how it affects and addresses misconduct and transgressions related to policing in San Francisco. And uh, what would you say to people who feel like, you know, there could be a quicker pace of those records under that, uh, under SB 1421 being released? Um, there's some uh, yeah, concerns about, you know, do, why is it, tell us about uh, quickly about the process that it takes to get those out. It is, it's, uh, it's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of documents. And so one of the things that SB uh, 1421 did was make all records releasable. And so for an agency, and, and you know, again, uh, the Department of Police Accountability is unique in this, but I can articulate exactly what it means for an agency like the Department of Police Accountability. Our records went back to 19, the early 80s. And so a lot of those documents, which are paper documents, they're not codified in records. So it requires hand counting. So some of the omnibus requests that we received, and again, we're not unique, were for all records for everything or all records for every officer or every transgression or every officer involved shooting that the office was involved with uh, in terms of their investigations. And what that means is in addition to doing hand reviews of all of these documents, and then they have to be censored with uh, information, some information isn't releasable. So let's say for a police report and you can, you can now publish that police report you have to take out some of the names of witnesses. You may have to take out some of the names of some of the non-targeted officers, or there could be sensitive information in there or non-disclosable information for uh, legal reasons that have to be hand edited out and then disseminated. And this is before we start releasing videotapes. 
or body worn camera information. And a lot of the videotapes uh, are, are literally on cassette tapes that have to be transcribed uh, and distributed. And, and lot, some of these earlier cases too, especially from the 80s and 90s, are handwritten. So you can't just scan and edit. Um, it's, it's a big voluminous project, but uh, I'm glad you raised it because one of the things that we report on now weekly or whenever we have police commission are reports both from the Department of Police Accountability and separately from the department as to where we are with 1421 releases, what we've released, how we've released it, what our numbers are, and what our staffing is associated with that work. But that's a huge, it's a, it's a huge undertaking that I don't think many counties, any counties, were ready for to do large releases at that scale. And I will say, uh, there's in the pipeline now, I think Skinner, uh, introduced a new bill that's going to expand 1421 and make it even broader. And so there's more to come, but we're we're at a new day in terms of policing. We're at a new day in terms of how we look at what law enforcement uh, is doing and what law enforcement is talking about it. I would say that that renewed awareness uh, is has brought us to a point where we have recognized as a community that it is just as important for us to tell law enforcement agencies what they can't do and what we don't, what types of behavior we don't want them doing, that's just as important as us telling them in the past as to what we do expect them to do to define public safety. And so that, that's a new appro approach, but it's an informed approach. And if our decisions aren't data driven, then they're hit or miss. And I think that's how we get to many of the race disparities that we have in our justice system right now by not making them data driven and relying on anything other than the actual data and the facts uh, to get to answers that I think communities are demanding now in new ways. I, I really do feel like we're at a watershed moment uh, and that we are addressing systemic problems and addressing institutionalized problems, specifically as we talk about race disparities in our system. Um, but I think we're approaching those conversations in new ways with new demands for outcomes that we, we didn't have uh, in the past, even though this is an ongoing conversation and this is an ongoing fight that we've been having for decades. I think we're, we're at a new place and we're at a new point in society. So. I don't even remember your question now. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, I was, uh, I was on a roll. <laughs> well, in oh, our final oh, in our final couple yeah. minutes, can you briefly tell us about the outreach program that you guys have, and oh. um, since some some there's some questions from the audience, um, where to where they can send those and answer questions. Oh yeah, that we, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so we we do a lot of outreach, and I think that's really important. It's one of the things that the agency was not doing in a robust way uh, before when we were the OCC. But I think it's really important to make sure that broad communities, specifically disenfranchised communities, know who DPA is and how to make a complaint and how to give input and feedback to law enforcement about transgressions, about misconduct, about their experiences with uh, uh, law enforcement here in San Francisco. And so that uh, that's really important to me. I, I mean, one of the biggest issues uh, that I want to make sure that we address is that we have a presence and people know how to contact us or people see us and have our information and know how to share their information. So some of the things that we've done is like prepared the uh, Know Your Rights uh, program flyer for the youth to understand what's going on with them and what their engagement with law enforcement can look like and what they can and can't do. So individual groups can take these materials that you guys have and disseminate to them to their communities. Absolutely, and I think these are important conversations. We, we can't take an aspirational approach to reform policing. We really can't. To the degree these are important issues, we have to be able to share what we've learned and what we know with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors. And we wanna make sure that our information is available to help facilitate some of those conversations so there doesn't have to be ambiguity about whether or not you can Shake, record uh, information or whether or not you can request information uh, from the police department or whether or not you can say something about the arrest of your son, your child, your mother, your sister, yourself when these incidents take place. I, I think that's hugely uh, important and I, you know, I take those things extremely personally. I'm a fourth generation San Franciscan. 
I, I've been detained and arrested no less than eight times. And, you know, I say that from the context of not having committed uh, a lot of the things or any of the things that I was arrested and detained for, but I understand from my own perspective uh, that we still have a long ways to go and people need to be informed so that they can assert themselves, so they know what their rights are, so that they know that they are empowered and entitled to race neutral policing, that they are entitled to safe communities without harassment, that they are entitled to share their voice and share their opinion and give input to the things that they care about, including their own civil rights, including their own rights to engage uh, in society without being harassed or without being uh, assaulted or without being mistreated for mm -hmm. whatever reasons, because they're a part of a, a vulnerable community or, and, or not just because. It's, and it's on, on, the, on that note, I'm afraid we have to, we oh, have to end it there. Yeah. We're a little, quite a little bit past, but thank you so much for your time and for um, those listening and for those who will be watching later, you can visit lvwsf.org slash police to learn more about policing, read reports and, um, you know, the government policing meetings and uh, to keep in tune with events like this. So yes. thanks again for your time. Thank you guys so much. Right. Thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Keep up the good work and everybody vote.